What's up, Bodybuilding.com listeners? My name is Danielle Bitts, and welcome back to the BBCom podcast. Today, I'm joined by Kristen Lettenberger. We're no stranger to Kristen here at BBCom, everyone. She's been on the pod before, educating us on all things pelvic floor and instilling the proper breath work into our lifting routines. If you missed that one, head back to episode eight to check it out. Kristen led our core recovery postpartum playlist on the BodyFit app and helps thousands of women online prepare for motherhood and beyond through movement. She's a doctor of physical therapy, certified strength and conditioning coach, and director of Bespoke Women, part of Bespoke Physical Therapy here in New York City. She specializes in women's health, along with general orthopedic conditions and injuries. Kristen's goal is to help women restore function and fitness through safe and effective movement. Kristen, welcome back to the pod. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be back again. Today is all about the moms or moms-to-be, and rightfully so, as this episode debuts on Mother's Day. Kristen, you yourself are expecting your first in less than two months now, Mm -hmm. so we're not only going to have a professional's insight, but real-life personal insight here based on what you've experienced experienced yourself these last seven months or so. So, team, today we're walking through movement guidance for all three trimesters, um, the do's, the don'ts, the cautionaries, as well as returning to exercise postpartum. This is an exciting one for us. Um, This is definitely... um, a gap in the educational field that we're looking to fill. Um, So I'm excited to jump in, Kristen, and I want to kick it off with topic one, which is trimester one. So you find out you're pregnant, right? And where do we go from here? Oh, boy. Yes. Um, So trimester one, I mean, when you're early on in that first trimester, so it's like one to 12 weeks is trimester one. You don't really have to change too much of your exercises. You can keep pretty much your same routine. But that being said, usually women are hit pretty hard with nausea. You get lots of different hormones kind of coming in, fluctuating. So your energy levels are going to be definitely different. And if you're working out too, on top of that, you need to be able to fuel yourself appropriately to kind of recover from those things. So you may not need to change too much of your exercises, but you kind of want to take into account your changing energy levels and start a mind shift of, okay, I'm pregnant now. I'm going to have to kind of step away from what I've been maybe used to doing and start taking like different steps for each of the trimesters. So Honor your energy systems. If you're really nauseous, you're not able to get enough food in, probably like tone it down those first 12 weeks of your pregnancy. And then the second trimester is what we'll get into. And and that usually feels a little bit better. So in terms of explicit movements, you know, are there things we should be avoiding? Are there, you know, kind of risk factors that we should be decreasing now that, you know, we're starting our pregnancy journey? Yeah, I mean, the major one is risk of falls any injury to the uterus, so like high impact sports, uh, boxing, kind of uh, things that would maybe cause some injury in that area can be detrimental to the pregnancy. So we just want to limit those things. So if it's a high risk um, factor, then we kind of just take that down. Um, So obviously, you know, we want to consult with our doctors and we're going to treat this as a case by case basis. But for you specifically, Kristen, you know, give us an insight, give us insight into maybe what your program looked like, you know, prior versus what changes you made when you headed into trimester one. Yeah. So when I was pregnant, I was still training kind of powerlifting style and I was doing heavy deadlifts, heavy back squat, heavy bench press. I was actually going into a strength block. So I was looking really forward to lifting really heavy and I could do that um, up until six weeks. And then my nausea hit so bad that I was living on white rice and soy sauce. <laughs> and I, I would go to the gym, I would do some movements, um, but I just could not output the same amount of strength that I was before. So I had to take that strength block and I had to like really tone it down and honestly do warm up sets just to get my body moving and kind of motor planning still um, and making me feel better. But if I needed to rest that day, I took a rest day. Yeah. And how are we kind of, you know, 
meeting ourselves where we are, right? As you said earlier in the intros, you know, how can we still get the blood moving? What are some low impact, low stress activities that we can do? If we're not feeling the best, we're not able to get our full nutrition in, we don't have mm-hmm. the energy levels to expend, we don't want to set ourselves up for injury, you know, what does that look like? Yeah, I mean, that could look like some people love doing yoga, some people love doing Pilates. If you're a weightlifter like myself, that's going in the gym and doing maybe body weight versions of it, or instead of loading the barbell to even like 60%, you're loading it to maybe 20 to 30%. And you're just taking more rest breaks in there. So you're just taking your time with each movement to kind of check in with yourself, really trying to get that core activation and really good warm ups. So you're spending a lot of time doing mobility you're spending a lot of time in activating your core. And so those are some ways that you can kind of meet yourself where you are. Yeah, decreasing that um, intensity factor and just yeah, 100%. Uh, matching the energy. So let's head into the second trimester. All the same questions apply here. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe we're, as you said, maybe that nausea is decreasing, you're overall feeling a lot better. But when it comes to movement, what are kind of the the bumpers that we're looking um, to instill here? Yeah, although like you are feeling better and you're like, oh, I can go after it now, um, you do need to kind of check yourself a little bit. You, we, when you get pregnant, you got to leave your ego at the door. So you can't be like ego lifting during pregnancy. It's not about this. We're trying to create a nice foundation for your postpartum recovery and also a lifetime of athleticism. So in that second trimester, what you can do um, is definitely, sorry, I'm out of breath. <laughs> <laughs> she is like pregnant, everybody. Very pregnant. <laughs> and it's very hot. <laughs> um, but during that second trimester, what you if you're starting to feel better, you can start adding in some more load and more intensity. You're just you, you're dialing back just a little bit um, from what you used to do in the first trimester or before pregnancy. Um, another recommendation is to your body is also changing so that baby is probably now bigger and your center of gravity is going to be changing Um, and you may feel some heaviness coming into the pelvic floor and so we start looking into pelvic floor considerations during our second trimester even in our first so we're looking for signs of diastasis or like a coning in the front which is too much pressure into that linea alba we're looking for pressure down into the pelvic floor if you're ever if you're experiencing urinary or fecal incontinence or you're just having musculoskeletal pains this is kind of when peak relaxant happens is between 12 i think to 15 weeks of your pregnancy so you can imagine your ligaments and your bones are just starting to shift to allow for this pregnancy to progress and for that baby to grow bigger so you're going to feel things more than you used to Um, and you might be experiencing pain that you didn't experience before. So this is a great time to just kind of like dial it back, seek help from a physical therapist. Um, I would usually recommend in the second and third trimesters kind of setting up a pelvic floor PT so you can have continued care throughout your pregnancy and postpartum. How can we start to understand kind of what the level of pain is, well, maybe I just need to move my body a little bit more during this time, or hey, maybe I need to, to back off, right? We know kind of a lot of the common complaints live in that low back during pregnancy yeah. and around the general core area where this is happening. Kind of, we kind of self-gauge that. How do we know when it's time to reach out for help? I mean, if you're experiencing pain for more than a week, I would say you should reach out for someone's help. Um, because during pregnancy your body's only going to keep changing so if you can kind of get on top of that beforehand you can mitigate a lot of those issues later on in your pregnancy so if you're experiencing low back pain excuse me um in your second trimester already that's a great time to check in with a pt see if you're actually engaging through your core properly and you're still maintaining nice hip stability. Mm-hmm. And for you, how did your program evolve, adapt, et cetera, during the second trimester? Well, I really started writing my own programs at this point. <laughs> so I added in, um, instead of more heavy barbell work, it was more like kettlebell work. So I was trying to get some conditioning of myself through there. Um, so in my second trimester, what I was doing, I tipped back on barbell, I added more kettlebell, I was doing like kettlebell swings, Um, 
I kept some of my main movements, but I brought my intensity down to about between 60 and 70% of my rep maxes. And I just monitored for those symptoms. So any musculoskeletal pain, any pressure into my pelvic floor, any diastasis or coning, which I, I do experience. So I, I have to be extremely mindful of it. Um, and then I'm looking for just like overall, how am I feeling day to day? Yeah. I want to talk about cardio for a brief second here. Mm -hmm. And this, this isn't specific to, you know, first, second, and third, it really applies to all. I think a lot of people are like, you know, we've seen the videos of, of, pregnant women running. We've seen them deadlifting 400 pounds off the ground and we see the comments that come along with that. But you and I have had the conversation of if this is something that you have been doing for a number of years at this point, mm -hmm. you know, it is okay to continue to a degree this act during your pregnancy. So kind of where do we start to understand, you know, someone who's been doing this for a very long time versus somebody picking up running for the very first time in their second trimester? Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, if you were able to run through your first trimester, amazing. Um, what if you're able to run through your second second trimester and your body is feeling good and you're feeling really stable and you're not having any pubic symphysis pain any urinary incontinence you can continue those movements it's great for like your mental health and mental well-being too but when you see these outliers of these women who are they're trained athletes and so they know their bodies really intuitively um, they're also probably have a team behind them being like, okay, yeah, you let's try this today. This looks good. Your form looks amazing. You're not showing any um, changes in your biomechanics. And so let's continue doing these things. Um, but for the majority of women, they, you usually do have to kind of step back and take it down. And um, if you're asking yourself, can I? Yes, you can. Should I? maybe not like what's the reason behind why you're choosing to do these things um and so what do you expect to do also postpartum right yeah maybe your second trimester isn't the best time to do your first crossfit class let's, probably let's, not let's rethink that one <laughs> but if you're an avid runner for the past eight years and you want to keep running you feel good and you get that clearance from your yeah. doctor then all the more you know more power to you absolutely um third trimester let's, yes. let's break that down okay third trimester is fun that's where i am right now um, you can, tr I'm pretty much, my training program has stayed the same. I'm just kind of toning down the weights um, and I'm seeing how my body's feeling on the day to day. If I'm, I'm feeling a little bit more fatigued. So sometimes you just start to slow down. The baby gets like real heavy and you start to feel kind of bogged a little bit more. Um, what we want to focus on in the third trimester though is really learning how to connect to your pelvic floor because we want to, yes, have that contraction, support our pelvic floor, kind of get those Kegels and things like that, but it's more important in this stage to find that lengthening aspect because when you go into labor, your pelvic floor needs to move out of the way. It needs to not be contracted. It needs to lengthen and stretch and move out of the way for the baby. So understanding how to get that contraction and then full relaxation in third trimester is really important. So we're adding a lot more mobility into this area. So we're doing a lot more hip mobility. We're do doing a lot more pelvic floor mobility um, just to help engage that baby into the pelvis. And we're learning mechanics on how to push, which is a little bit, it's not intuitive for a lot of people. So belly big, belly hard, use your diaphragm to push down and you're thinking about opening your rectum. And so it's that type of almost like a bearing down, but release that we practice um, throughout the third trimester. But you can keep your exercises going. Um, you may be more winded in your third trimester, so you just may need more breaks. Um, and we're also looking at probably you're changing your squat because the belly, you need to accommodate more space for the belly. So if you're doing deadlifts, I moved from conventional to sumo because I couldn't get past my stomach. And then I moved from a regular back squat to a box squat because I wasn't able to maintain my pelvic control like as well. So I was doing more pelvic tilting. Um, and then you also want to think about if you're putting too much pressure into that linea alba. So 
doing like a bench press on flat on my back. I was seeing more coning, so I just elevated it. Um, I noticed it with planks, kind of elevating my planks and my push-ups and modifying there. So we're reducing too much tension into the front here to kind of decrease our risk of a continued diastasis into postpartum. Yeah, and Kristen's been putting out a, a lot of great pregnancy modification content on her Instagram, which we'll share at the back end of this episode, but really helpful take, um, tangible takeaways for users. So Kristen, we're gonna spend most of our time here. This is postpartum. So mm -hmm. we've we've gotten to it. We've gotten to the the, the big day. You're you're yeah. it's coming up for you, right? <laughs> so this is the mecca of today's discussion because there's a huge gap in terms of how women can safely return to exercise post birth. Obviously we're going to have to navigate this differently again based off of what type of birth, vaginal versus C section. So let's consider both options. And two, let's talk about recommended time frames, order of, of events, progressive overloads and things of that nature. Nature. So, I mean, let's start day of, right? Yeah. Baby's here. I want to start mm -hmm. right there and can pro progressively work ourselves up yeah. into the weeks and months that would follow. Amazing. And I have my patients and clients start day zero with some movement and some breathing techniques. So you set up a great foundation during your pregnancy. We practice all these skills during pregnancy so that you know how they should feel postpartum. Because now that that baby that was inside you creating all this tension like in your abdomen is now outside of you and <laughs> that is feeling a little bit loose and a little bit more squishy and so harder for you to engage so day zero what is happening regardless of birth regardless of a cesarean or a vaginal birth regardless of tearing um, what you're going to be doing is diaphragmatic breathing so you're going to be taking nice deep breaths trying to expand through your abdomen 360 degrees around and then you're trying to just gently engage through your transverse abdominis which is your deepest core and your pelvic floor now you may not feel it the same way you did during your pregnancy and even before pregnancy but you got to trust the process that when you do that exhale you're getting those gentle lifts and so you just progressively do that over the first two weeks how are we navigating cesarean versus vaginal birth? Obviously, two completely disruptions here. So yeah. kind of break down both. Yeah, so if you um, happen to have a cesarean birth, that's a major abdominal surgery. So they go through seven layers to get to that baby and then they suture you back up. And um, we have to be now mindful of a surgical wound during that time. So usually the timetable gets pushed about two to four weeks, depending on how you are doing during that recovery. Um, <clears throat> so instead of a vaginal birth, we'll be just a little bit more time, maybe in that first phase of rehab during a C-section. Okay. And how does that impact returning to sport, or returning to movement, I want to say? Not everybody's returning to a specific sport, but they do want to return to an active lifestyle. Um, what considerations are taken into place in terms of rehabbing there based off of type? Yeah, so we have to be a little bit more mindful early on with movements when it comes to a cesarean. Um, because of that surgical site, we want to sort of preserve any... Um, sutures that have occurred there and so we don't want to we want to avoid like excessive we don't want the wounds to open so we need to be more mindful of rotation um, load and recovery during that time um, opposed to a vaginal birth mm -hmm. Let's talk about when we start reintroducing movement. Mm -hmm. So maybe we're doing things on the table, on the floor, et cetera. We're learning how to re-engage our core. Um, our our patience is, is lacking. Mom wants to get back to the gym or the road or whatever it is for her. When do we start reintroducing some of those movement patterns, standing them up on the floor and getting some strength back? Yeah, I mean, you're doing a lot already with the baby. So you're picking them up, you're squatting down, you're bathing them in the tub, um, you're doing tons of laundry, you are doing a lot of the movements that you would be doing in the gym, now you're just doing them in real life. So what we want to think about is we use exercise to complement the things that you're doing throughout the day so that you feel more stable and more controlled in those positions and have less pain. So when we're doing the breathing in the transverse abdominis and the Kegels kind of in that first half of the, like the first two weeks, you should start to start 
feeling a little bit more connected to your body. And then we're moving into body weight exercises. So these are going to be movements that you're really familiar with. This is including bridges, squats, and we're also adding some postural movements because in those early weeks, my main complaint is actually from um, breastfeeding. So it's like that hunched over neck position. So we do a lot more postural work, a lot more mobility in this stage, and we're adding in banded work here. Um, and so you'll get back to doing movements that you're familiar with, just body weight versions within the third and fourth week postpartum. And then from there, it's just we progressively over overload it. What is the general timeline, Kristen? This is, again, mm -hmm. I say general, general emphasis on general here. It's gonna be case by case and you have to get this clearance with your with your care team. But let's say day one to 90 or maybe day zero to 90, as mm -hmm. you put it, right? Those first three months, how are we bringing new moms and new parents back to a consistent workout routine? Um, you know, when are we picking up weights? I mean, it's, it's very similar to a recovery protocol from, surgeries and injuries, yeah. right? That's how yeah. we're approaching this. Yeah, I mean, it, you can be really systematic about it and then you can modify as needed for each person. Um, so really the first two weeks is that early rehab stage. And then th weeks three through six, we're kind of adding in more of those movement patterns you're really familiar with, doing body weight. Six to eight weeks is usually when you get doctor's clearance um, to resume activity. And what does that mean? Um, it means your tissues have healed. So if you had any tearing with a vaginal birth, your C-section scar is, is healed, so you're able to go through the movements. You are not at a point where you can take on the same amount of load that you did during pregnancy because po the postpartum body is more vulnerable than, it, than a pregnant body. And that is because fatigue and now you, you're breastfeeding, or if you choose not to breastfeeding, you're still recovering from those nine, 10 months that you were pregnant. Um, so that takes a little bit longer than the six weeks that the doctors recommend, but six weeks is when your tissues are healed. So we can start adding load then. And this is like small amount load. So baby kettlebells. Yeah, like let's add a goblet squat. Let's do some lunges. Let's do a step up or step down. And so that's in our six week. Around eight weeks is when I start to try introducing just some plyometrics, really light plyometrics. So like pogo jumps, um, static mountain climbers, just so we can get more core engagement, more um, hip movement. And then um, at like that eight weeks to about 11 weeks, we're progressively adding more plyometrics into it. So if you want to return to a higher impact activity like running, jumping, um, <clears throat> anything that involves you kind of sprinting on one foot, we I usually say we, we wait till 12 weeks to kind of really introduce that. But we're building up strength from day zero to those 12 weeks. Um, and so it's, we're really systematic about that. And then at 12 weeks, we do like a return to run program. And so you're back, that's already three months there at your 12 weeks, if we're just getting back to baseline of where you were um, pre-pregnancy, probably even feeling stronger because you've been really slow and committed and intentional about your movements and how you build your foundation. Um, you'll be able to get back to almost full sport probably around between 12 to 24 weeks. Now, Kristen, you're an outlier in the sense of yeah. <laughs> everything you've continued to do, you know, throughout this time. Um, let's talk about motivation for expecting moms and then new moms, too. I, you know, speaking real for a moment, movement isn't uh, in the top of their head. I mean, mm -hmm. their lives have been turned upside down for the better, right? Yeah. Um, but then there are also things like postpartum depression to think through and, and more the mental health aspect of it. So, I mean, one, you know, how do we find the commitment to stay moving, stay moving during a pregnancy? And then the second part to this question is, you know, how do we motivate new moms to, you know, put their health and their bodies first again as they're mm -hmm. adjusting to new life? I always say movement is medicine. 
And it's like the analogy when you're on a plane and you have to put on the, your mask first and then help someone else. So if you're not taking care of yourself, you're, you're not going to be showing up for your baby 100%. And so there's a lot of mom guilt sometimes when I'm like talking to people and they're taking that hour to to work out or get some movement in and um, but at the end of the day I'm like that makes you a, a better mom because now you can show up more fully and so I think moms just need a reminder of that a lot of times of like you can take this time for yourself because this is what's going to make your time more more valuable in the, in the later points um, <clears throat> but the easy way of like adding movement back in, kind of working through either baby blues or if you're you're dealing with postpartum depression, of course we need to seek help for for that and you need to talk to someone. But um, I love movement snacks. So like exercise snacks throughout the day because um, you don't necessarily have to do the 45 minute workout. You can do the 45 minute workout 10 minutes throughout the day. And that's like four to five points of your day that you're doing some kind of intentional movement um, and you're getting the same volume and load that you would if you just did it straight through but it's more manageable so adding things like a band next to your breastfeeding or um, wherever you are feeding your baby like on the stand or in the diaper bag and just doing like a couple banded pull parts when you finish putting a diaper on them and putting them down um, so just making it more accessible throughout your day, I think, makes it a lot easier for moms to start creating a program and being more consistent. Kristen, you are about a month and a half out from meeting your little one. Uh, two months, right? Se- Where are we? Seven weeks. Seven weeks. And yeah. <laughs> what's What's been the biggest learning lesson for you during this period? Oh, boy. <laughs> I mean, I really did have to tone it back. Um and so I had to check my ego a few times. And um, it's fascinating because I feel like I've, I've coached pregnant and postpartum moms for uh, like years now. And now going through it myself, I'm like, I have a whole new appreciation of what that fatigue feels like, what your body feels like, how sleeping just sucks so bad. (laughs) Um, It's like a cruel joke of you having insomnia during pregnancy and then knowing that you're not going to be sleeping postpartum. It's like, oh, God. (laughs) Um, So I feel like I've learned a lot going through it myself. And I, I just I. I like to think of it when I'm in the gym and I'm moving myself intentionally and I'm working out that this is a real privilege that I can do this for myself and I'm doing this for my baby. So I'm like setting up a good foundation for her so that I am hopefully going to recover a little bit faster so I can show up for her every day. You said a public gender reveal on the BBCom podcast. Excited to <laughs> I'm meet having baby girl. A girl. <laughs> <laughs> Kristen, we were thrilled to have you back on today. Thanks for all you do for women seeking more education around pelvic pregnancy and postpartum health. Please remind the listeners how they can follow along for more content and education. Yeah, so I have a ton of information on my Instagram. That's at Kristen Lettenberger DPT. I'm sure it'll be in the show notes because it's a very long name. Um, But you can also find me at Bespoke Treatments in Midtown in New York City. I love treating prenatal and postpartum moms and helping them get back into exercise. A lot with pregnancy and postpartum is individualized advice is always best. So if you're unsure, just seek the help. Um, We're here to help you. And there's a lot of individual recommendations. So you're never alone. Um, Keep moving. It does help. And... Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming by again, Kristen. Happy Mother's Day to all of the BBCom moms out there, and thanks for tuning in to another episode here at Bodybuilding.com. Stay tuned for more stories along the way. Uh, yeah. uh-huh. Uh-huh.